Hello and welcome again to this edition of Meet the Candidates on WCMU. I'm David Nicholas and we here in 2020 are speaking with our guests virtually, welcoming uh, today, uh, and that includes uh, John DeMoose. He is the Republican candidate for the 107th Michigan House District. That is an open seat in uh, this election. Good to have you, sir, and congratulations on the win in the August primary. In the first minute or two, um, a little bit about you, your background, and the experience you bring to this campaign. Sure. Thank you, David, for having me, and thank you for doing this. It's such a strange campaigning year that we need all the help we can get on the field there to, to get our message out. I'll tell you what, I, I'll give you a little bit of our background. I started off in politics long ago. I grew up with uh, Ronald Reagan as my president. When he, I was eight years old when he came into office, 16 when he left, and those were my formative years. And I got to grow up. I didn't necessarily understand all of his policies, but just with this understanding that a president was larger than life, and it formed my political viewpoints. And I ended up going to the University of Michigan, became the president of the college Republicans there in the early 1990s as political correctness was sweeping across college campuses throughout the country. And I always assumed that, that I'd go straight into politics, but ended up feeling called in a different direction. So I, my first uh, job was at the Christian Broadcasting Network, and I had an idea to produce a, a two-hour film on the history of America, interviewed a lot of great leaders. In fact, my first interview was Jimmy Carter, which just blew me away as a young 25-year-old guy. We ended up leaving there and starting a film production company with the goal of telling great American stories that in this deeply divided age of ours, there must be certain things that we can all agree upon. So we did, for instance, a, a film a television special on Arlington National Cemetery, and what that says about our country, Medal of Honor recipient. We worked with Ford Motor Company as they did, uh, went through the turnaround without taking government money. I've worked with a lot of organizations in Washington um, all of whom dedicated to this idea of grace and civility. And we've touched so many different areas and also at the same time run a business for over 20 years that I think we've gained a lot of experience that could be useful in, in uh, the current crises we're facing. As we mentioned, it's an open seat in the election this year. So I'm wondering, sir, you as candidate and then the potential voters in the 107th, in the time running up to August and in the time since, you and they, uh, what have you identified, uh, along with those uh, potential voters, as key issues for the campaign? All right. Well, there's a couple of key issues as we've gone around the district. Up in our area, the top thing I hear all the time is, what are you going to do about the shutdown? When are we going to open up? And people are really upset with um, how the governor has sort of gone it alone on this and gone around the legislature. So the COVID crisis has been a big deal. And I, uh, my perspective on it is maybe a little different from some of my party. That I mean, in the beginning, we... Uh, we all were scared by this. Nobody knew what was happening. And I extend a huge measure of grace to both our governor and our president. This is something totally new. And I think they both tried really hard to do this right. As it went on, I think people have exploited it for political purposes. And I really don't like ruling without the without the legislator, legislature. And it's not just a matter of the types of policies coming out, albeit I have a problem with some of those. It's even how they're structured. I was sitting up in Detour Village in um, the Eastern UP, which is a pretty remote town. On the, uh, oh, it was when the Executive Order 160 and 161 came out. And those were where they were limiting indoor gatherings to 10 people. And I was sitting with this uh, restaurant operator, just talking to him, and they had been closed. They were struggling to reopen. And they said, oh, I guess this means we have to close again. Well, it didn't. That wasn't the intent of it. But when you go off on your own, you, without all the other voices speaking in, saying, hey, I think we should clarify this. I think we got to be careful here. This is what happens. And the people in, the, in this uh, state don't need to be confused any more than we already are by what's going on. The other thing is we have some unique um, economic issues uh, facing us up here. The, the second, number two thing that I uh, keep hearing on the trail, and it's probably uh, a longer term thing, is that people want to build an economy where our children and our grandchildren can stay closer to home. We don't have that right now. In fact, it's personal. I just two weeks ago moved my daughter down to Virginia for her first job because she couldn't find the type of work she does up here. And I think that re involves really reassessing our economic and educational priorities up here. So I'm very, uh, I'm really building our whole campaign about around this idea of, of building a skilled workforce. In fact, I started a co, um, I co-founded an organization with David Cole from the Center for Automotive Research on this very topic to change the impression of manufacturing 
careers and skilled uh, skilled trades that young people have today because they picture these old, dark, dirty, dangerous, dead-end jobs, the four Ds, and that's not true anymore. These are well-paying, honorable jobs. And so I want to do things to encourage more career tech ed around the district, and then as the workforce develops, encourage more manufacturing. I, I think we need a couple good factories up here. So those are the, really the two things. And the other big one that goes part and parcel with, with those is um, rural broadband. Because we can't, we can't grow our full-time year-round population until we fix the rural broadband problem. Well, let's look first at, at the point you brought up about the, the shutdown and the reopen. Um, as we sit down today, there are legal challenges to the governor's authority. And this is going to happen then in, the, in likely some solution to the present sitting legislature. And we emphasize again, this is an open seat. But I guess I would look to your proposals as if elected, how does the legislature and the governor's office come together to address this in a more cooperative fashion? Do you have a proposal of how we can bridge the gap that we seem to find ourselves in? Well, I probably don't have a specific proposal yet. These are complicated issues that I need to work with people, but I'm beginning to form relationships in Lansing and explore different ideas for how we institutionalize approaches to future uh, emergencies. And I'll tell you, we need to do it for our businesses. I've run this biz uh, business for over 20 years. And we, we got hit hard like everybody else did after 9-11. And I rebuilt the business. We got hit crushed in the Great Recession. It took years to rebuild the business, but we did. And we're finally off to a good start. We turned things around. We're growing. And then this happened. And I'll never forget looking down at my phone around March 15th. I had no intent of shutting down. Um, but my fi final client shut down, and they can't advertise. They can pursue their marketing if they can't, can't be open. And so we did close down. I thought, you know what? There's got to be a lot of business people out there like me. I built, rebuilt it once. I rebuilt it again. I could probably rebuild it again. But if we get another shutdown next year, it's just not worth the trip. And um, I, there's a lot of businesses out there. So wh whatever we do, we need to begin to institutionalize how you respond to things. The second thing is we need to change. I absolutely believe in getting rid of the 1945 law that has perpetuated these, the extension of these emergency powers. That wasn't the intent of it. And we have these rules in place in this structure of government in place, not for when things are going great. We, it's there for when we have emergencies. We need more minds, minds there on these uh, solving these problems. And the third thing that I'm really strong about is a more regional approach. And I'm not sure what that legislation looks like yet, but I will pursue it, that we, uh, we institutionalize, that we look at things on a more local level. Because there was no reason why we up in the uh, northern lower peninsula and the upper peninsula here needed to be treated uh, the same way as Wayne County was treated. There was a much different problem down there. And we have a much different economy where we dodged a bit of a bullet, but had this come two months later, it would have crushed us because we have to, we have to sort of earn our keep in four months over the summertime or we're dead. So. If we look then at this impact of COVID on, on the overall economy, and these are points that you mentioned too, um, having an economy that will keep future generations closer to home, building a, a stronger workforce for a landscape and an economy that's, that's certain to change, as uh, you're alluding to also. And then one of the real results here, um, the lack of uh, the rural broadband that has come into play. How uh, specifically might you look at these in terms of that overall restart and re-engaging what's likely to be a, a changed economic landscape. Okay, I'm not 100% sure I follow, follow the question. It may be my fault here, but but I do know that we're, I'm already working on the rural broadband issue. And you know what, it's, it's interesting. There are a lot of great companies out there that are making real progress. I mean, the message isn't out there yet, but I've worked with um, a group, that, that, an association that's working with all the small providers, because we have a lot of small providers like CenturyLink and others up in the UP. And there is a ton of government money out there. They're trying to solve this problem. AT&T's got some great plans that they're working on right now. They're starting with, um, with uh, first responders and building all these first responder networks all in rural areas. Um, and then once those are completed, they'll start to use them commercially. So that's going to help. Elon Musk, um, what he's doing with Starlink, that might circumvent the whole thing because that's really starting to take off. So there are good programs already helping there. As far as the other things, um, I think a lot of it gets, a lot of these are very complicated issues. 
And so some of it gets into things like curriculum in the education world that what do, what do we need to ask ourselves what we really value. And there's no question that math is important, science is important, English in some circumstances, those types of um, cor traditional courses are, are very important. But we too often pursue those at the expense of some of this career tech ed stuff, which is really important. There are kids who are called to work with their hands. They do amazing things and we need it. So I think encouraging that, uh, more focus on curriculum with that. And one of the big steps in that is to build more bridges between, uh, build, or there are bridges there, build better, even stronger bridges between the public schools and community colleges, because that's a great partnership that um, we see in our area of Harbor Springs really, really works. I mean, it's a, our, our, our small Harbor Springs school district doesn't need to have a ton of EP classes and a ton of other things going on. We can't afford it. We're a small district, but we don't have to because we've got a great community calendar and a range where we can send our kids over there. So there's a lot of interrelated um, factors. I don't know if I answered the question you were asking. No, it, it, it did get to the idea of how we're going to adjust how you see uh, the pathway to to readjusting to what is likely to be a, a changing economy. Uh, we've got just a, a little over a minute left, and I, I do want to leave time for a final message you want to leave with the voters. But even to just note if there is another key issue that, at least without getting into how you would address it, key issue that you or the voters have identified, uh, things that you would uh, then be putting as priorities should you be elected in November. Well, sure. I mean, I do think we, we need to continue to, um, education is a real priority for me. And a lot of times people in my own party, I think, go too far the other way against public education. We've got to get this funding worked out. I'm concerned there's always an issue. Everybody always wants more money. And I was talking to um, some of the university people out there recently, and they were concerned about their budgets being cut and are not growing with the times. And I get that, I'd love to help the universities, but until we get the K through 12 funding fixed, I really, I really am not gonna spend a lot of time on that. So I think there's some educational issues. We've got issues like um, people are always talking about um, consolidating school districts up here. And that's a problem um, for, for us because school districts are, uh, are so vital to a community's identity. And so the biggest thing for me is how do we, re how do we grow these things all at one time? broadband access, careers, housing, so that we can attract more full-time residents. And the fact, this is a unique issue for our part of the state here, but the fact is the stage has been set by this crisis. A lot of people up here have chosen to stay, uh, be, to put their kids in school this school year up here because we're open and downstate is all virtual. So I think we need to really sort of capitalize on that and see if we can't get off of this seasonal economy that just crushes everything. In the, the last uh, really less than half a minute here then with you, sir, a final message that you would want to leave with the voters as they get set to go to the polls. Sure, I mean, I'll tell you this, is I have some very strong beliefs. I'm a committed conservative Republican. I have been my whole life. But one of the things that guides me is, and has guided me for years is the sense that we need to rebuild grace and civility in our political process. And I think anybody who watched the most recent presidential debate has got to say this isn't the way it was supposed to be. I had a great debate with my counterpart yesterday. He was so kind and respectful. I was kind and respectful. At the end, he smiled, gave me a big smile, a virtual handshake, and I did too. And I think we left expressing very different viewpoints, but we're not at each other's throats. And I, I really think, given what's happened in Michigan and on the national level, that's what's called for in the coming years. Well, we certainly appreciate your time, not only speaking with us, but to uh, the potential voters in uh, District 107. Stay safe. Good luck with the rest of the campaign. And thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, David. Yep. John DeMoose has been our guest here on Meet the Candidates, the Republican candidate for House District 107, open seat for this upcoming election. Following the uh, state laws, all qualifying uh, party candidates have been invited to participate in this series. I'm David Nicholas. We appreciate your time and attention as always. Join us again, and remember to go out and cast your vote on Tuesday, November 3rd.